By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are going to look at a game between a deck that I've called Meekstone Green. It's a deck that I'm playing with today. It's kind of green control. And I'm actually taking on another control deck, but it's a little bit more famous than mine. It is a stasis deck and it's being piloted by Andrew. And Andrew, you're new to the channel. Welcome here on Timmy Talks. He just joined me on the patron program. And um, Andrew told me that he plays a lot of kitchen table with his brother. And this is one of the decks that he plays when he faces his brother. And I recognize that Andrew because I've played tons and tons of kitchen table with my brother. It's a great way to improve your magic skills and just actually it's just a great way to try out a lot of quirky decks. It's like a lot of fun, but you're playing stasis, but you're playing stasis in a way that I can actually appreciate it. You know, I don't want to give away too much yet because I'll show the whole deck in the deck deck section. Talking about that, I know that some of you uh, enjoy going straight uh, to the action, to the games themselves and skip the deck deck. Uh, you can do that by going to the description below. Check that description there. You will find several timestamps. Click on the timestamp that reads MTG Games and that will take you straight to the action. Uh, also, if you want to know more about the specific rule sets that we play, like what rules, what cards are allowed, what cards are not allowed, if you care about that stuff, again, all that info is in the description below. Okay, so I guess now we're ready to start with the first deck deck. I'm going to first take a look at my deck, Meekstone Green. Okay, so this is the deck that I'm playing with today, Meekstone Green. And I think I've made a few changes the last since the last time that I, I played this, since I took this picture. Maybe you recognize that. I mean, you've got a deck. The best way to improve a deck is by playing with it, tweak it. You know, that's one of the most fun processes of deck building, I find at least. And I think I took out the Rod of Ruin, put it in the sideboard, and I put in the Tonus's Coffin. Um, so that's one of the changes. That's all I can see for now. Maybe I made a few more, but we'll just have to see when the, when the game evolves. But to just the core of the deck is still the same. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to look at green in a different way. Um, I know that a lot of people who play green kind of play green aggro with some tempo advantage like Llanowar Elves, Ice Storm, um, stuff like that. Just trying to get a lot of uh, weenies out and put pressure on using Berserk as well in there and Giant Grove to just deal a lot of damage quickly, which is a great strategy. Probably the best strategy with green, you know, go green aggro. Um, but I wanted to look at it from a control perspective. So what I've done, I've added some artifacts to make it more controlly. So I've added three Icy Manipulators and three Meek Stones. For me, Meek Stone seems to be kind of a natural card to use with green because green has a lot of smaller creatures um, like Thicket Basilisk, Cockatrice, it's got a lot of good creatures that don't have a power greater than two. And what Meekstone does, it says each creature that has a power greater than two does not untap during their untap step, right? So for me, it's really handy to use that, of course, in combination with the IC Manipulator. I tap down the creatures of my opponent, and if they're big enough, they're not going to untap, right? So that's just a little trick. Then um, the creatures that are still active in the game, I want to take them out. And how do I want to do that? I want to, for example, use my tracker. Tracker is one green and two a card from the dark, and for two green and tap, it can fight with another creature. Now, the tracker is only a 2-2, two -two, but I can pump it with my Wailuli Wolf, a card from Arabian Nights. It can give plus one, plus one to any creature, so I can make it a 3-3, three -three, and then it can kill whichever creature has power uh, two or lower, and I can take them out with my tracker so that my opponent basically only has tapped creatures on the battlefield and no creatures anymore to block with. And then I can just go and start attacking him with my, uh, with my power two creatures. And I'm also playing two living lands in this deck. Living lands is just one of my favorite cards because the art is so epic. So one green and three, it's an enchantment. And it reads all your forests become one, one creatures. Right? So I'm playing with a lot of forests. Actually, all forests in play become creatures. So if my opponent has forests, they become creatures too. So my idea is to kind of control the board with Meekstone, kill the smaller creatures uh, with, for example, Lure on Thicket Basilisk or with the Tracker, right? And then when I've done that, I want to play my Living Lands to kind of finish the game. And I think Living Lands is really cool because I can also use my Pendle Havens then to make my forests into two, three creatures. So yeah, I kind of like that. I'm also playing one Hurricane, as you can see, which is actually a finisher, like if I need to finish, but also if my opponent plays with a lot of smaller 
uh, flying creatures, I can take care of that with the Hurricane because in this deck, I'm only playing with actually two flying creatures myself, two Cockatrice that are two four flyers. So I can just safely play a Hurricane of three without dealing or without killing any of my own creatures. I'm also playing with a beautiful beta Stream of Life. Just want to point that out. I think Stream of Life... It is such a cool card. It's actually called Magic's the perfect magic card. Why? Because the text of the card has never changed ever, ever, ever. It's always stayed the same. So it's kind of unique in that way. And I'm playing it. Um, yeah, again, I, I kind of see it as a control card, right? Because when you're behind, you can just gain tons of life and that will buy you time to kind of set up your whole control strategy. So um, anyway, this is my deck. Um, I'm not sure if the tapping down is going to work since I'm playing against the Stasis deck who probably wants to tap stuff down as well. But you know what? We'll, we'll see how it goes. Who knows? Maybe it'll work out. So this is my deck. Now let's take a look at the deck of my opponent, Andrew. And here we see the deck of Andrew. And as you can see, it is a Stasis deck and uh, not really the Stasis deck that maybe you're used to that we see a lot now because this actually has creatures in it. And I'm happy to see a deck with creatures. This reminds me of what stasis used to be played like back in the day. So maybe first talk about stasis, right? One blue and one for an enchantment. And it reads, players do not get an untap face. It's as simple as that. And then you gotta pay one blue during your upkeep or stasis is destroyed. Now the cool thing is of, uh, of this little mechanic is that it, it, it almost works like a, a cumulative upkeep, right? Because when you pay one, you tap an island to pay the one blue, but remember, nothing untaps anymore. So your island doesn't untap. So next turn, you need another island to tap or a mana rock or in the case of Andrew's deck, maybe a Birds of Paradise, right? But at a certain point, you don't have enough blue anymore to pay for the stasis and the stasis destroys itself. Now, because you don't have an untap step, stasis works very well with creatures that actually don't need to untap. So creatures that attack and don't need to tap when they do. So Sarah Angel, Yoshin Soldier, and then a card that I'm really excited about to see, Zephyr Falcon. So all these creatures don't tap. And this is like a synergy that uh, you really saw, you know, back in the day when people started playing with stasis. They combined stasis with creatures that didn't have to tap when they attacked. You call it vigilance these days. So it works great, right? You attack with the Zephyr Falcon, it doesn't uh, uh, tap, so you can attack with it again next turn. Now, um, the problem, of course, is with stasis, like I said, at a certain point, you cannot pay the upkeep anymore. Now, there's a little trick, and the trick starts with Birds of Paradise. Birds of Paradise, one green for an 0-1 flyer. You can tap it and give you any color of mana. So you can tap it to give you a blue mana to keep stasis around. The problem, of course, is once you tap it, it doesn't untap. There's no untap step anymore. But wait a minute, I can play Instal Energy. Instal Energy and Enchant Creature for one green. And it reads, you can untap your creature during your main phase one additional time. So with Instal Energy on the Birds of Paradise, I can untap the Birds of Paradise again in my main phase and I can tap it then the next turn to play for the blue for Stasis. So if I have Birds of Paradise, Instal Energy and Stasis in the game, or I should say when Andrew has that because it's his deck, he can keep stasis around forever. How cool is that, right? So he can keep stasis around and he can control the board and keep attacking me with his creatures with vigilance like his Sarah Angels and Sephir Falcons. Um, so that's really nice. Another way of how we can win the game is through Black Vice. Black Vice and stasis, they just go hand in hand, right? Black Vice says for every card over four cards in your hand, you take a damage. So if you've got seven in hand, you take three damage. The problem is... When you're the opponent, you're playing against stasis, you cannot empty your hand because your lands don't untap. So you probably got a hand full of cards and then your opponent plays a vice and you just take damage after damage after damage. So, you know, Andrew has multiple ways of winning this game. So it's quite nice. There's one card though that I'm really missing in this deck. Uh, and maybe Andrew, you can let me know why you decided not to play with it. And that's Howling Mine. I think Howling Mine, is absolutely necessary in, in, in any stasis build. So I would definitely recommend it for you to put it in your deck. I think it will definitely make your deck even better, right? So that's just a little tip. Do with it what you want. You don't have to follow it, of course. Uh, I really love the fact that you chose to go the creature route, playing creatures in a deck instead of a creatureless deck. I love that, man. I like combat. I like creatures. I like to see creatures like Zephyr Falcon finding a home in a deck. I love that, man. So this is the deck of Andrew. And now let's go. To the games.
And here we go, game number one. So I'm the player with the Wood Elemental playmat playing against Andrew there with his uh, mono blue symbol playmat, I guess. And look at that, we've got the same dice, sweet. And we're keeping our hands, it seems, playing a forest into a Lanora Elf. So that's a great start for me. That's basically what I want to do with this deck. Uh, on turn one, that is. And there is a Black Vice, so only going to take one damage, having five in hand. And playing a second forest. Attacking for one. Okay, so I guess I don't have a tracker or anything else. Playing a soul ring. So finding a lot of mana in those first couple of turns. Let's see if I can do something with that. And he's playing a Birds of Paradise and an Island and passing turn here. I am untapping. Maybe if I can get to five mana, I can play a Thicket Basilisk. Ooh, playing a lure. Okay, so I'm doing this to kill the Birds of Paradise. And I guess we're taking a damage here. So we're playing with Mana Burn. And there's a damage here. Uh, I mean, the, the Birds of Paradise takes a damage here because of that lure on the Lunar Elves. This is a pretty cool way of kind of destroying a Birds of Paradise. Obviously, I don't have a Bolt, but this kind of works. And there is a Mace of If by Drew. So you can start using that Maze. And he no longer has to take the damage. And finding another four. So I've got five now. Using his mace, of course, to send back the Lanawar. Tapping four. There's a Taunus's Coffin. So one of the cards that I made, uh, that I put in the main deck. And the cool thing about Taunus's Coffin is uh, you can pay, uh, I think, three mana and tap it. And then you can put target creature in the coffin. And it's basically exiled out of the game. And then when the coffin is removed from the game or untapped, the creature comes back into play tapped. So that's an important detail. And that's why Taunus' coffin can work really nicely uh, with Meekstone. There we see Andrew casting a Zephyr Falcon. Originally a card from Legends. I believe this is a 4th edition one. A 1-1. One, one, and you don't have to tap it when it attacks. And it's got flying as well. Playing a Pendlehaven, but what I really need here is an extra creature so that I can start attacking again. And I'm probably going to pass here. I can put the Severed Falcon, of course, in the box, but I can do that at instant speed. So I can just wait for him to attack with it and then in response put it in the box. So Andrew's going to attack. So I'm going to pay three here, putting it in Taunus's coffin. So it's out of the game. And I can choose not to untap the coffin during my untap step. And then it stays in the coffin. So it stays out of the game. Let's see if Andrew can play anything. Looking at his hand here. And passing turn. Okay, so I'm going to keep the coffin tapped. Why not? So Zephyr remains out of the game. Tapping one green. Playing another Lanawar Elves. I'm not really finding my bigger creatures. There is a Mana Vault, tapping four. There is a Juggernaut with an Instal Energy. <laughs> oh, I really like this play. And he's attacking me for five. I'm going down to 13. A really nice use of Instal Energy. Because Instal Energy also gives creatures the ability to attack the turn that they come into play. So that's really nice. And I'm probably not... Oh, I'm not untapping... My Taunus's Coffin, that is interesting. I wonder if I have, for example, a Crumble in hand, attacking with both creatures first, and then using my Pendlehaven to deal an extra point of damage. And now I'm using a Meek Stone, okay, so that's why I didn't use the Taunus's Coffin on the Juggernaut. So the Juggernaut is no longer going to untap, but of course he can untap it an extra time, and now I have to Crumble it. I think... I think that's what Andrew was pointing out. He's like, well, your Meek Stone doesn't work great with Instal Energy. And I actually think now that I'm looking at this game, I'm thinking, wait a minute, this could be a new deck, Meek Stone with Instal Energy. That could be really funny. Anyway, passing turn again. And he's going to untap the Mana Vault. So he's not going to take a damage. He's still on 20, by the way. Or actually, he's back on 20 after that crumble, I should say. Gained life from that, of course. Attacking with two again, sending one back and pumping the other one. And we're actually kind of discussing 
this and what we agreed upon we just said you know what i'm going to attack you're going to wait until i pump one and then you're going to maze it so you're just going to take one damage at a time i know that technically he always takes two i guess but anyway we we kind of agreed on this and i, I think that's absolutely fine there is another zephyr falcon so one is in the box one is in play this is a legends one a one one flyer and he can start dealing some damage again i'm already on 13 i'm actually quite low so i've got control but I'm not really finding a way through. I'm not drawing into any creatures. And um, what I could have done, of course, is choose to untap the coffin. But, I mean, that wouldn't really help me much, would it? So attacking first. And he's going to use the maze again. So he's going to take one. going to go down to 18. And let's see, what else am I going to do? Tapping. Am I going to cast a tracker? Okay, so this is the 2-2 tracker for 2 green and tap. I can fight with another creature. So I can use it to kill that one Sephir Falcon on the board. So that's actually quite nice. And he's going to attack me, so I'm going to go down to 12. I think he still needs to take that point of damage, by the way. And go down to 18. Maybe I'm missing something. Anyway, playing another forest. Gonna use my tracker to kill the Zephyr Falcon. And then I'm gonna attack again with two. So he's probably gonna take another damage. Gonna go down to 18. Well, maybe now we were discussing it that. Anyway, taking a point of damage. So slowly Andrew's going down in life, but I'm on 12. So let's see what he can do. Tapping two green. Finding a Winter Orb. Ooh, that's annoying. Winter Orb means that I only get to untap one land, well, both of us, during our untap step. And passing turn here. I think, actually, that a Winter Orb could start working against Andrew, because Andrew wants to use his Maze of If every turn. And I'm sending back the Sephir Falcon, so it's out of the box. That probably means that I want to kill it. So going to use the Strip Mine on the Maze of If. And I'm going to attack here for two. Pump it as well with the Pendulaven. So it's going to take three damage. Going to go down to 15. Then using the Tracker on the Sephir Falcon. Sephir Falcon is out of the way. And it's not looking great here for, for Andrew. He needs to find something here. Going through his hands. Just passing turn here. That's pretty bad. Now I can attack him again, and I can hit him for five in total. It's going to go down to ten, so he's got two turns. He's got to find a solution here. Untapping his last forest, going through his hands. And this is a little bit desperation mode, just playing stasis, so it buys him one more turn. So I cannot untap because of the stasis. And I decided to just to pass here. And now Andrew cannot pay for the one land, so the stasis destroys itself. There he goes. Can he extend his life? Can he find a solution here? Going through his cards. And passing turn. So everything untaps on my site. So I'm going to hit him again here. Hitting him for five. So he's going to go down to five life. And passing turn. And remember, the Winter Orb is still active. So you can only untap one land during your untap step. Playing a City of Brass. And I'm untapping my Pendlehaven. Attacking again. Dealing five. That's it, I think. Or not. Oh, unsummon. Oh, so he's playing an unsummon. Double unsummon. And uh, I'm playing a giant grove. And that's the end of game one. Okay, so the giant grove kind of won it for me here. Wow, interesting. Finish there on the game. So this was game one. We're going to shuffle up and then we'll catch back up, to, up with you in game number two. Game number two. Here we go. So I'm one game up. 
And let's see if Andrew can put up a fight here. Going through our hands, are we going to keep yes or no? That's the first question. Looks like I'm keeping and Andrew is trying to decide here. Is he going to keep? And I think, okay, probably just drew eight instead of seven. <laughs> that can happen. And uh, he's on a play here, starting with an island, playing a soul ring passing turn. Playing a forest and pass. So a pretty good start from Andrew with that soul ring playing a City of Brass and pass four mana, no Yoshin Soldier, for example, or a Sephir Falcon. If he can find another white, he could cast a Sarah Angel. Instead, there's a Wall of Swords, a 3-5 Flying Wall, and remember, walls cannot attack. Playing another Force, will we see a Tracker? Maybe a Lunar Elves? No, there is a Meek Stone, which is not going to be very useful against that wall. Unless, of course, I draw into an IC and I can tap the wall down. Finding another forest and pass here. Four forests. Not happen. There's not much happening yet. Maybe there's some action now by Andrew, who's playing Zephyr Falcon. I believe Andrew is not tapping a blue for that, but he's got the blue. It's all good. Playing a Diamond Valley here, the card from Arabia Nights. So you can tap it to sacrifice a creature and you gain life equal to the toughness of the creature. So it's a really cool, cool little card. And passing turn here to Andrew. Andrew tapping four, casting a Juggernaut. And I'm really happy now that I have that Meek Stone on the table because Meek Stone says um, creatures with power greater than two do not untap. Ooh, tapping five for a Thicket Basilisk. So it's two, four, and everything it blocks, it kills. But oh, look at that, a Power Sink from Andrew. So that thicket is out. So that is a really good play by Andrew here, countering my thicket basilisk. That means I'm probably going to take six here from the Sephir and the uh, Juggernaut. And he can now actually use the Maze of If to untap his Juggernaut. Looks like he's not seeing it. So that means the Juggernaut is going to stay tapped. And I can pay four now. What am I going to cast? Going to play a Living Lands. Oh, that is pretty funny. So Living Lands enchantment, uh, it means all the forests turn into 1-1 one, one creatures. And Andrew actually has a forest as well that turns into 1-1. One, one, one. I'm not sure if this is the best decision, but at least it's something. I wonder what I have in hand. Oh, no. Power Sink. Oh, no. Andrew, why? It's a cool card, man. I think it would actually be worse for me than good, but I do understand Andrew countering it. If you see an opponent playing a quirky card like that, he probably has a plan. In my case, I don't really have a plan. And there is, ooh, look at this, Stasis and a Black Vice. And I've got five in hand, so I'm taking damage. Also taking damage from the Falcon. Six in hand, passing turn, Andrew paying one blue for the stasis. That means next turn I'm going to take two damage. Playing another vice, okay, I'm going to take four damage. And of course the damage from the falcon, I'm going to go to ten. Going to take four, going to go to six. Oh man, there's nothing I can do, I've got seven in hand. I'm tapped out. Oh man. And I can untap, but that's before, you know, untap, then my upkeep, and then my main face. Gonna go to five. I think I'm dead. Untap, upkeep. So I can stack it in a way that I can still play instance. So if I have a crumble, for example, play a double giant grove on the, on the Sephir Falcon, and playing out a crumble. So that means I'm actually not taking any damage. Wow, look at this. I'm still on five. That is pretty ballsy. Playing a White Lily Wolf. I think I'm still going to die, though. But, I mean, this is, this is a cool way. I mean, fight to live another day. And uh, I'm on five life.
And it looks like I'm going to uh, just pass turn after playing the wolf. So that means I'm going to probably drop to four with that Zephyr Falcon. And paying three for a Yoshin Soldier. Attacking me, going down to four. I mean, it's, it's still looking pretty bad for me, but I'm just trying to stay alive. We're trying to hang in the game, hang into the game, and maybe I can find a way out of this situation. Playing a lot of our elves. Remember, I also have the Diamond Valley, of course. And with Wailudu Wolf, I can give a creature plus one, plus one, and sack it to the Diamond Valley. So basically, that's two more life for me. So I think if he's going to attack with the Yoshin Soldier, I can choose to block it on the Lana or make it into a 2-2. And then I could even sack it if I wanted to, choosing not to. I guess he's not even attacking with the Yoshin here. Ping! Oh, stream of life. Gaining some extra life here. So, um, gaining five. That's kind of nice. Going back up to eight. And what I can do as well, of course, if Andrew attacks with the Yoshin, I can block on the Wailuli, tap the Wailuli to pump itself into a tutu so it doesn't die. So we're, um, yeah, we're kind of really slowly going towards the end of this game here. But maybe, you know, maybe I can find an answer. A cockatrice would be enough. To stop the Sephiri Falcon. A hurricane would be enough as well. Let's see what Andrew can do here. Two cards in hand. Tapping two. There's another stasis. Oh, and that's great timing because I'm all tapped out because of the stream of life. So that's well played here by Andrew who's attacking me. Going on to seven. Finding a forest. Passing turn, at least it's something I can play out so I don't take extra damage from the vice. Paying another blue here for the stasis, attacking me again, going down to six. And pass turn. Oh man, and now I've got five in hand. I need to empty my hand, but can I empty my hand? Pointing it out as well. Five in hand, that means that vice is going to be active again next turn. And that's double damage for me. So passing turn here and Andrew paying another one. Still has that City of Brass to pay for another upkeep for his stasis. Let's see, what is Andrew going to do? So I'm on five now. Going to pay a green and play a Giant Grove. And sack it then. So play the Giant Grove. So I gain four lives. So I'm going back up to nine. This must be so annoying for Andrew. He's like, please die now. And I just keep postponing with these crazy tricks. I'm on nine. And Andrew's playing an unsummon over the juggernaut. Interesting choice. That means the stasis is going to go. And he's attacking me again with the falcon. So I'm going to go down to eight. I've got four in hand, so I'm not taking any damage. And at least I can untap next turn. So hopefully I've got like a cockatrice or a hurricane to deal with that Sephir Falcon. That Sephir Falcon is really the MVP of this second game. It's dealt so much damage. It's, it's insane. There we go, finding a forest. What can I do here? Looks like I'm just passing turn. No, I'm not. Okay, playing another Meek Stone. Oh, man. I think these Meek Stones are not doing much against Andrew's deck. There is a Birds of Paradise. And tapping four. There is the Juggernaut again. And I'm on seven with another attack from the Falcon. And I'm going to draw here. Playing a Strip Mine. So I guess I can strip the Maze so he cannot untap. His Juggernaut, although he didn't use that ability earlier in this game. Pay a, oh, playing a copy artifact over the Juggernaut, right? Wow, yeah. So that is pretty powerful. That's another five power on the board. He's probably going to force me to sack my own Walulu Wolf here to try to stop the bleeding. So I think if he attacks with the Juggernaut, I'm most likely to block it on the Wailulu Wolf. It's going to pump itself. Then I'm going to sack it after blockers are declared. So I'm going to go up to nine, taking a damage from the Falcon. I'm going to go down to eight. But at least I've blocked the Juggernaut. 
and I'm going to destroy his maze of if. Tapping three green for a tracker. Again, I can block and then I can sack to gain some life. I mean, here you can see the power of Diamond Valley. Just because of the Diamond Valley, I'm just able to keep postponing the, looks like the inevitable. And he's putting an instal energy on the Juggernaut. That is pretty cool. So it untaps. That's a big problem for me. So he's going to attack. I'm going to block again. Sack it. Going to go up to 10. But then I'm going to take 5 from the Unblocked Juggernaut and 1 from the Sephir Falcon. Uh, and I guess I'm going to take an extra damage somewhere because I'm going down to three. Shouldn't I go down to four? Oh, he's probably also attacking with the Yoshin Soldier. That's probably it. Playing another tracker. But, I mean, this is not going to save me. And playing Sarah Angel is going to untap again with the install. Yeah, now I'm really, really dead. Anyway, going to attack. With the army again, I can block the jar and I go to five, then take two from the Yoshin soldier and the falcon. I'm gonna go down to three, and next turn I'm toast. There is a stasis to make matters even worse for me here. Tapping a green for a soul ring. And passing turn here. And this must be it, right? There's no way out for me. Absolutely. Maybe a fog, but I'm not playing one. Anyway, <laughs> that's it. So, uh, well done, Andrew, man. You've won this second game. That means it's 1-1, one, one, and we're going to go to game number three. Game number three, the big decider. Whoever's going to win this is going to win the match. And uh, I can say, Andrew, it's been a lot of fun playing against you, man. Thank you for bringing your cool stasis brew to the table. It's really cool. It's, it's been a while since I've seen Yoshin Soldier and Stasis together on the board. So I like that. Anyway, um, let's look at the start of the game here. I've started with a Lanawar Elves and Andrew started with a Vice. And now I'm playing a Sylvan Library card from a Legends Enchantment. One green and one to cast. And you can look at the top three cards of your library and then put them in any order. And then you draw a card. And if you want to, you can draw extra cards, two in total. But you have to pay four life each time you do that. So it's pretty expensive, but uh, it's a really, really good card. I love it. Very useful to play with. There is a Sephir Falcon by Andrew. And I believe I'm going to take some damage from the Vice, right? No, I'm not. Okay, four in hand, no damage from the Vice. Looking at my cards, am I going to draw an extra one? I'm kind of... Okay, drawing an extra, taking four damage, going down to 15. Paying three to cast Tracker, and I cannot find a land, so that's probably the reason why I decide to draw extra cards, trying to go to a land quicker, but ooh, Andrew playing a second Vice and attacking with the Falcon, that means I've got five in hand, going to take two damage from the Vices, going to go down to 12 here, and now the question is, am I going to use my Tracker to kill the Sephir Falcon? Playing a Soul Ring... Instead, I wonder what I'm going to do. I'm a little bit into tank here. Do I want to use the tracker or not? That's probably a good decision, though. Instead, I'm attacking with both. I don't expect Andrew to block here because of that pendulum. I'm going to take the damage. And then, okay, this kind of explains my move. Playing a crumble on a vice does mean that Andrew gains a life from that, going up to 17 again. And now I've got four in hand, so I'm not taking any damage anymore from his remaining Black Vice. He is going to attack, of course, with the Falcon, so I'm down on 11. And I have to say, he's, he's putting some pressure on me again. I'm, I've also done it to myself, of course, drawing that extra card from the Sylvan. But uh, I'm a little bit low on Lance. Oh yeah, I was showing him my Celestial Falconer. Uh, it's a 4-4 creature, a legendary creature. Uh, and the strange thing about the Falconer is it's red and it's green. And I don't really get that because the Sephir Falcon is blue. And I'm like, okay, there's one other Falcon in the game. And then you've got a Falconer in the game. And it doesn't even share the color. Come on. It would have been nicer if the Falconer would have been um, maybe blue and green. I don't know. At least then you could play them together in the same deck, I guess. If you build some kind of Highlander, Commander, whatever deck. Anyway, um, finding a land, dropping a forest on the battlefield, tapping four here, playing an Icy Manipulator. We haven't seen the Icy yet. Ooh, that's a power sink. But I've got Lana where else, of course. Oh, I think Andrew 
overlooked the launderer, so now I can pay the tax for the power sink. Oh, that is tough. That is tough here for Andrew. Because I think it was a good decision to play the power sink if he could have actually countered it. Because I see is such an annoying card to play against. And looking, by the way, at the mana base of Andrew, it looks like Andrew is pretty short on mana. I haven't noticed yet. But it looks like he's also been missing some land drops. And that makes the IC even more problematic, right? Because I can start tapping down his lands. For example, his, his only island. And then he cannot play any blue cards anymore. So that's pretty problematic for him. Looks like we're kind of discussing the play. And I can't remember. I think I remember that Andrew didn't want to take it back. He's like, nah, man. I made the mistake. It's all good. Because I said, you know, you can take it back. It's just an oversight. It's fine. But I appreciate it, Andrew. You're like, oh, man. I made the play. I made the mistake. It's all good. And now he's playing a copy artifact over the IC. That is pretty sweet. So now you get this IC battle where both IC manipulators are probably going to keep each other in check. And he's attacking me with the Sephir. I'm going to 10. For some reason, he's tapping my IC. Don't think that was really necessary, though. Tapping three here, playing... Ooh, getting back my crumble. And then crumbling his Icy Manipulator. Oh, man. That is pretty harsh. That is pretty harsh. And he's gaining four life. Gonna go up to 19. And now, of course, the question is, oh man, I keep playing with Copy Artifact and I keep forgetting this. Is, uh, does Copy Artifact also copy the casting cost? I think it does, actually. I think it does. So, um, you know, Andrew's gaining four life here. Anyway, we're passing turn. I'm killing a Sephir Falcon finally with the tracker. It took me a long time before I did that. And there we see the Sylvan Library going off again. Looking at my top three, I think that Sylvan is really um, going to help me here. Has helped me already a lot, actually, in the game. And look at that mana base of Andrew. Only two forests and a single island. That is not great for him. Attacking with the tracker. And then playing a cockatrice. Keeping my Llanowar Elves. Ooh, again. Power sink. I wanted to say keeping my Llanowar Elves untapped to probably tap down his island. Oh, man. I'm sorry, Andrew. This is just mean of me. But of course I want to win. We're in game number three here. And, uh, actually, kind of vague what I did there, uh, but I'm playing a thicket, and I'm attacking, and, uh, passing turn, and I'm already saying I'm going to tap down your island, so Andrew is now in 14, yeah, it's going to be tough, I mean, the first thing any deck really needs is mana, right, you need lands, you need something, so, Andrew, let's hope that you can find a land. I think in your deck, actually, a Sylvan Library would also be quite nice, since you're playing with green. I'm going through my hand and attacking now, using the Pendlehaven, dealing six damage. That's quite a lot. Andrew's going to fall down all the way to, I believe, eight and playing a Wailuli Wolf as well, so more creatures on the battlefield. At least he's found a land. It's a Plains, maybe. I mean, he does play with Balance. Ooh, Disenchant. For a moment there, I thought maybe it's a Balance. If he, can, if he can actually find a Balance next turn, does he have a turn still? I think he does. Two, four, six, seven. Yeah, yeah, he's got a turn. He's got a turn. And if, as long as you've got a turn, there's hope. Pumping it, so he's going to take 7 damage. No, no, Giant Grove? Giant... Oh, I'm playing Living Lands, not sure why. <laughs> okay, that's a mistake. Anyway, playing Giant Grove. Uh, sorry, Andrew, man. You lost this one, but I have to say, I mean, game number 3. Like I said, if you don't draw into any lands... You cannot really win a game in Magic. There are only a few decks that can survive without lands. They're specifically built for that purpose. 
Anyway, Andrew, thank you very much for supporting me on Patreon and bringing your deck here to the table here on the Timmy Talks channel. And I also would like to thank you, the viewer, for watching another episode of Timmy Talks. And if you want to support the channel, there are a few really simple things you can do. First off, you can leave a like, hit that thumbs up button. It really helps a lot. The second thing that you can do is leave a comment. Let me know what you think of this match. You can also share this on your socials. And the last thing that you can do is if you're new here, first off, welcome to Timmy Talks. You can click that subscribe button and you can become a subscriber of the channel. All that really helps Timmy Talks grow and helps me continue making this old school content for you guys. Talking about that, you can also support the channel financially by becoming a patron on Patreon like people uh, like Andrew did. And the cool thing is, if you want to, you can play against me, but also your name will be in the end scroll. You can join our Discord. You can join Timmy Talks events. There are just so many things that you can do if you become a patron. It's only $1 a month. Well, it starts from $1 a month and it goes all the way up to $5 a month if you want to support me. Um, so yeah, those are the options. And now let's take a look at the end scroll. And let's take a look at all the fantastic, amazing patrons and channel members of Timmy Talks. Ik het als fikker te somber gezien.